from just outside Washington, D.C. in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of introductory slides, and then we're going to hand this off to our presenter today. But before I started, um, as many of you know, I've recently relocated from Florida, so I want to do a shout out thinking about all of our cultural institutions down there and all the folks dealing with the hurricane today. Um, I'm also going to put in the chat also our National Heritage Responders number, which is a number that anyone can use um, when they're dealing with emergencies or disaster situations. So that number is going to appear in the chat in a little bit. And if anyone knows anyone in Florida, please feel free to pass it along or anyone else dealing with the disaster situation. So you are here today for Fundraising for Collections Care, another one of our C2C Care free webinar series. Again, my name is Robin Bauer Kilgo. I'm the C2C Care Coordinator, and you just saw Mike Morneau. He's our Senior Producer at Learning Times. I always like to start these by showing a little bit of our home on the web, connecting to collections.org. Um, that is where you will find all sorts of fun information, including our upcoming programming, curated resources, also um, our link to our curated community, which is a place where you can ask questions related to collections care. We have a fabulous group of volunteer monitors and experts who help monitor that community. So if you have a question on anything, I encourage you to go there and at, ask it, and we will see about getting you some good information. We also have two places that we're on social media, which is our Facebook page and our Twitter page. So I encourage you to follow those if you haven't already. As Mike said, there are two ways you can communicate with us today because we are using Zoom webinar. There is a chat box where you can say hello, which many of you already are, or maybe showing your location, and also the Q&A box. The Q&A box is there for questions for our presenter. You can put a question in there at any point during the program and we will try to get to it during the Q&A period that's happening afterwards. We are also recording this webinar to be posted on the FAIC YouTube channel later. We do have some upcoming programs for C2C Care that I encourage you to go and take a look at on our website. Our next free webinar is scheduled for October 11th. It's Forget the Best, Good and Better Approaches to Preservation. That's actually a joint program done with CCAHA, the, Center, the Conservation Center of Art and Historical. Um, they're great. They're out of Philadelphia. We're excited to have that program, which is going to talk about just ways that you can really apply collection standards to your institution and how that are attainable. Um, so for all sorts of different institutions. So I encourage you to go check that out. We also have a course that's being launched in October. Um, until October 1st, you can actually get the early bird registration rate. It's a five webinar series all about keeping collections safe in storage. We're going to be breaking that webinar series up into types of collections, and each week there will be a presentation on how to store them, what's the best way to deal with preservation standards. Um, it should be a really good time. It's running from October 13th to November 17th. We do charge for those courses, but like I said, it's a, there's an early bird registration rate going up until October 1st. So if you're interested in that topic, go to the website, read about it, and you can register for the course. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker. Uh, our speaker today is Bryce Gorman. He is the Grants Manager, Office of the Lieutenant Governor's Business Office, State of Indiana. Um, we're really excited to have him today to talk about fundraising, which is something I think we all we all have experience with, and it's always good to hear from a collections care standpoint. So Bryce, feel free to start whenever you're ready, and we'll see you during the Q&A period afterwards. All right. Thank you very much. I am really excited to talk with everyone today. Uh, let me make sure I'm sharing my slides. And there we are. <clears throat> uh, and thank you everyone for, for coming in today. I know fundraising is a little outside of the scope of what most people expect to do when it comes to collections care, museum work, nonprofit work. Um, and there's, there's different perceptions of fundraising. And what today is intended to be is not to be um, this isn't supposed to be an absolutely comprehensive look at fundraising. There, there are graduate studies, entire programs devoted to this. There's webinars and, and guides and all number of things for every facet of fundraising. So the objectives today, we're going to just, uh, for those of you who are fairly new to the fundraising, maybe you've been pushed into this, whether wish to or not. Maybe you're seasoned and you'd just like some, uh, some ideas that might work for your organization. But I thought this would be good to just do a quick refresher of the process. 
Um, there's a few things that I'd like to specifically note about record keeping and planning for your organization. And I'd like to touch on a few things that would be most pertinent, I would believe, uh, I would hope, to collections care. Then we're gonna start getting into some of the, the details about the actual solicitation process. So we're gonna talk about some of the options. Um, I've got a couple stories, hopefully some things that'll be relevant for you. Um, and I'd also like to talk about some of the solicitation options, benefits and risks, because there are benefits and risks to all of them. And then finally, I would like to spend some time talking about ways that fundraising can fit into your organization and your own role in a way that would fit best. Um, uh, also, just a heads up, if there are any animals that pop into view, um, either my dog or three cats, I apologize in advance, they, uh, they don't listen to me. So, Fundraising, one of the first things I'd like to say about fundraising is that fundraising is something that should be reflective of you as uh, either a director of the organization or uh, someone who is new to collections care. It should reflect you and it should reflect your organization. Um, authenticity is it, it's very important in the fundraising world. People need to trust you. And um, what I'm going to share throughout this webinar, some of the options, some of the things that I've seen other organizations do, some of the things that I've been a part of, they, may, they have worked for us. They may or may not work for you. But uh, during this webinar, I'd like you to think about ways that it could work for you um, or maybe some tweaks that you'd like to put in to adapt it. Um, and something that I'm going to say right off the bat that has always been important to me as a fundraiser, and I've been a fundraiser since 2000, effectively 2009, but um, uh, it gets a little murky at times. I've done a lot of volunteer fundraising over the years. Fundraising is not begging. And that's the reason I have this picture from the Smithsonian collection. This is a, uh, an 18, uh, no, a 19th century collections alms box. Um, and a lot of people have the perception that fundraising is begging or that, you know, you are taking something from someone. That's not the case. Uh, this alms box is there to help the poor. And in your own case, you are helping your organization. We're going to, we'll talk about that a little more, but that's something I'd like to really stress today. So fundraising works in a cycle. Um, and I know we have some, uh, from my perspective, international attendees. Um, I saw, I believe, Lima. I saw England. Um, of course, we have Mike from, from Canada. Um, and uh, so there are going to be different rules from uh, an international uh, or US or Canadian perspective, um, but fundraising is still going to operate on this cycle. Um, I won't dive too deep into this, but most, most of the time we'll start with identification. Who are your donors? Where are your likely donors? Who are some of the people that you would like to be donors? Um, so you'll be identifying those potential donors, moving in towards qualification. So qualification is taking those people who are potentially donors and finding out who are your most likely donors, who are your most prominent donors, uh, who can help you get to your goals. Cultivation is one of the biggest aspects of fundraising. It, it, most of the time, it actually takes the longest period in cultivation. If I were to essentially do this as a length of time, it might be kind of bowed out. But cultivation is the relationship building. Um, moving into the solicitation, which kind of seems obvious. This is the point where you've decided, what are we going to ask this person to do? Uh, it could be money. Maybe it's something different. And then stewardship. 
Stewardship is the renewal of this cycle, and it's the time to show somebody that you have done something of substance with their contribution. It's a time to kind of renew this relationship building because you're going to have to build trust from there if you ever want a second gift. Um, often the first gift is not nearly as hard to get as the second one because you need to show that you have done something with their gift. Um, planning is something that I would love to, uh, I could do an entire course on fundraising planning. Um, in fact, it would still not be enough. But something for those of you who are either in a uh, starting phase for your own organization's program, I know that some of you are with uh, organizations that probably have very developed plans, but when it comes to a specific goal, a specific uh, mission for your organization, maybe you need to, maybe you have a uh, $500,000 project and you need to set your own plan for this. So wherever this may work for you, uh, it really comes down to what do you have and what do you need? In the planning process for fundraising, what resources do you have available? Um, and I say resources because um, some organizations, uh, I've noticed a few of you on the chat, you may come from uh, larger cities. And so what you have available, you have a large donor pool nearby. You may get international attention. You may have a large city or state attention. You may get a lot of eyeballs. That's wonderful. There's a lot of potential to find donors. Other organizations uh, may be in smaller communities and there's still an opportunity there. In a smaller organization, so let's say rural Indiana, um, I'm in Indianapolis right now, but in rural Indiana, usually a smaller organization there might be kind of the historic focal point for the county or for a large portion of the state. But there is a connection between that organization and their county or their area that no one else can really tap into. So with the planning, look at your strengths. Um, where are the areas where you have strengths? Uh, what does your board look like? What strengths do they have? Do you have excellent writing skills? Um, uh, do you have a robust website. Um, maybe, maybe you have a prominent place in your town, city, wherever your location is. What can you work with? And look at the prior work. What have you done before? What has worked? Maybe what has not worked? Um, there are times where I've been a volunteer for, um, for an organization and they, early in the 90s, they did a lot of races. Um, and that was a common way to fundraise at that point. Uh, but then it just became time consuming and the return on, on all that work became less and less. So yeah, they generated money, but looking at that prior work, maybe it was time to move away. And then what do you need? what are some tangible goals for your organization? So uh, tangible goals are, are important to, to consider in fundraising because uh, let's, say, let's say you're an organization that, oh, you need $100,000. That's a nebulous amount. I just pulled that you know, out of thin air. And uh, sometimes people will say in fundraising um, letters or things like that, well, you know, we need to, maintain the mission of this organization, uh, or we need to keep the lights on, or we, um, uh, we need to remain a community asset. All of those things are true. There's no denying that. But your audience may have a different perception. Uh, your audience may look at that and think, well, I can't give $100,000. I can't maintain your mission. Um, what they can do, is something along the lines of your donation of $1,000 can help protect or help safely house and protect the Dr. Pritchard collection so that generations of women can see this, this incredible 
pioneer into medical history. I'm using my wife as an example and, and it's gonna drive her nuts. Um, with that whole your $1,000 uh, statement that I just made, is that a reasonable goal? Some of the organizations on here today may look at $1,000 and think that is a small amount. Um, others of you may think that's too high, but let's tailor those goals to fit your needs and in a way that makes sense. Um, I've worked with a number of organizations who have very big needs. The, usually it's a capital need, so big buildings, uh, one organization uh, needed a couple million dollars to fully rehabilitate their building. It was, it was not good for collections care. Um, the heating was all <laughs> out of shape. It was, and it was, uh, it was a mess. Um, I'm clearly not going to name names on this, but this organization had huge goals. Their area did not have that kind of money. So rather than, than help them with a plan that looked at, well, let's find some very large donors. Those donors aren't in that area. Let's broaden those goals potentially. Let's, let's explore that later. But right now we need to focus on making the perception of this organization a community asset and seeing what donors we do have how can we move them up the fundraising chain to, to move those $100 gifts made to 200 or the $25 gifts to 50 So let's just slowly increase that part because that's reasonable. Um, and also know your limitations. Um, as I alluded to with the, uh, with the races in the, in the 90s, you would spend uh, huge chunks of time uh, just setting up all of the courses and getting the numbers and working with all of the the various uh, entities. And when you thought when well, when uh, the team thought about this, really, they could have sent out a uh, annual fund letter and received the same amount of money without going through all of that physical and mental work. So be mindful of your time. Uh, record management. Uh, this is specifically for organizations that are in kind of a new stage for fundraising. Um, whatever fundraising you do, whatever operation, however much or little, document it. Please document it. I was with gift processing with Tulane University for three years, and uh, this was post Katrina. So we had tons of gifts coming in, lots of records to update, lots of records to maintain, um, which is great. It's a wonderful, it was a wonderful um, turnout by the alumni and parents and friends. Um, but it was important to maintain all that information in a dedicated system for Tulane, uh, in a comprehensive and consistent way. So anytime somebody made a uh, uh, credit card gift, that was documented. It was documented what they gave to, when they did it, uh, whether they included their spouse on this, any notes, because uh, any of the other fundraisers who went out to call this person, thank them, ask them for uh, more, they needed to be aware of that. Um, you don't want to catch someone unaware, uh, or heaven forbid, if uh, you go and talk to a donor and say, have you considered making a gift of X to this organization? Then be caught unaware with, oh, I sent in my gift last week. That just puts you in an awkward spot. So anyways, if you are just getting started with record management for your fundraising uh, program, Find a system that works for your capacity. Uh, I personally, there's a lot of very expensive systems. Um, Salesforce is wonderful. Uh, Razor, Razor's Edge is, is good. Um, I've used a bunch of different systems. They're fine. They cost money though, but you don't necessarily have to have that. If an Excel spreadsheet is something that will fit your organization, that's great. That's perfect. Just keep it up to date and stay on top of it and make sure you maintain that information, that's perfectly fine. 
For those of you who are in uh, collections care, um, the, uh, what is it, the constituent donor uh, module, I believe, for Pass Perfect is a great way to maintain those records. So you can, you can use that if you need an improvised system. Um, and uh, I, I have here on the right-hand side some key information to maintain. So contact de details, you wanna make sure you have their address, phone, email, document their giving history. Uh, and along with that, solicitation history, um, because if you have asked somebody for $500 to support this initiative, and let's say they say that, well, this car collection is neat, but it's just not my passion. Document it. It's okay. Because the next time you go to ask them for money, it might be, well, you certainly wouldn't ask them to give for your uh, car collection. Maybe this time it would be for one of the collections about um, first responders in your community. Maybe it would be to, uh, to provide better cases and, and uh, a more structurally sound environment. Um, sorry, uh, a more sound environment for that collection. Uh, and that way you have your solicitation history saying, they're not interested in this topic, let's move on. Uh, along with communication history. Uh, if you call somebody to say thank you or anything like that, then it is important to document that. Finding your key donors, I'm gonna stress that key doesn't always mean wealthy. Um, key donors uh, could mean people who are engaged. Uh, I do like to break it up into engaged and influential because when a lot of us think of fundraising in those key donors, uh, most of us automatically turn to who are the wealthiest. That may not be the, the key donor for your organization. Um, somebody who is engaged and passionate about your program may fall more under a key role than, uh, than someone who has a large checkbook because they're familiar with you. They are consistent. And when they are asked to step up, they are more likely to do so. Influential donors would be those who have the wealth and connections that you can make use of. Um, these would be people with business connections, family wealth connections. Uh, you can look at their position either with their employer. Uh, you can look at past giving. Um, if they're a large donor, then you can see some of the times where they're mentioned about their support for, for, uh, for an organization. Now, a major donor, I, I want to stress this for those who are new to fundraising, a major donor is going to be dependent. Most of the time, for most organizations, this is your top 20% of donors. Um, they are, they should be highly engaged, um, but whether top 20% of your donors means 10 million, 10,000, or 1,000, entirely up to you. These are the people that you should, you don't have to spend all of your time with, but you need to be on top of them. Make sure that you are aware of what their interests and needs are. Uh, because consistently over the past 20 years, major donors, that top 20% of donors are giving 80% of giving to organizations. So looking at the, uh, the planning stage, the prior donations and prior work, you can look and see who have the who has been that top twenty percent. It may just be one person, uh, but whatever it is, those will be your major donors. I like this chart because it's a good way to break up the uh, who counts as a major donor, who counts maybe as not. So, looking at the entire like the entire population around your organization, everyone who's either in the area walked through your doors, so forth. You have uh, wealth up and down, inclination or um, how it inclined they are to support you in some way, left to right. So someone here in the high wealth, someone who has the funds to support you and really cares about you, these will be your major donors. 
this will hopefully be your board. These will be people who want to step up, ask their friends to step up. These are people who are going to host events. Um, these are some of your key donors here. But that doesn't mean we can ignore the people here who have wealth, but they're not as engaged. Now, this is going to be, um, if you're new to say grant writing, it might be the National Endowment because maybe they don't have a history with you. Um, this may be large donors who are just unaware because uh, I've never received a gift from, from uh, Jeff Bezos. Not that I'm aware. I think I would remember it. He doesn't know who I am. That's, it's, he has a lot of people asking him for money. For people with, like that, you can build their inclination, but you're going to have to do it in a natural way. That may take time. Um, and if that time is worth it to you, that is entirely your call. Low wealth, high inclination, these will be your most loyal donors. They'll be giving year after year. Um, I give to my alma mater monthly. Uh, it works for me, but it's never going to be an amount that has a comma in it. That's, that's okay. But these are people that you should reach out to, to come to events, to, uh, to attend things, to be volunteers. You can ask of them their time. Uh, and so these are passionate people. Um, and then finally, the low wealth, low in inclination. This is the general public. This is not an area that I would focus on highly. Um, if things change and they either move more into their inclination, they get more interested in you, maybe a hobby or something that you put on as an event is of particular interest, that may move them. Um, but until that happens, usually in a kind of organic way, I wouldn't spend as much time with this. With the relationship building, so let's looking at those donors, the people who are passionate, the people who have the wealth. Um, let's look at the building of those relationships. Um, I uh, I cannot claim that invite and form involve inquire is mine, but for the life of me, I can't remember who originated it. So if anyone knows, um, I am sorry in advance, and I would love to give them the appropriate credit. But this goes to the cultivation. This is one of the, just a refresher, this is one of the longest portions of building these relationships. Uh, I love these four eyes, but these people, you wanna make sure that you're bringing them in on experiences, if you will. Uh, so behind the scenes tours, if you have a new collection, um, this is a, ridiculous idea. I've seen it done before. I can't guarantee that it has raised money, but I found it kind of amusing from a fundraising point of view. If you think about some of the unboxing videos that have come in, uh, become popular on YouTube, and I, I know I'm, I'm old, this has been popular for a while. It has a lot of the same fascination for when your organization may get a random box and you have to decide what to do with it. But seeing that process, seeing how you look through the layers of materials and talk about this is something that uh, is, is a good representation of this area we've been trying to fill, or this book uh, we're going to have to take particular care of because the spine is coming apart. We might have to go to a professional to have this worked on. You're reminding them of your goals and you're reminding them of all the work that goes into collections. Um, I'll be honest, my background is fundraising and uh, I did not know how expensive collections care was until I started working with historical societies. Holy cow, that stuff is pricey, but your general public might not know that. Bringing them, pardon me, bringing them behind the scenes is going to show them how that's happening. Um, involving your, your uh, prospective donors, asking them to volunteer, serve on the board if it's applicable, if, uh, if, they're, if they have experience that would be helpful, great, bring them into the board. Um, ask them if they can make connections, ask if they'll host an event. Um, people love to be asked to do things that aren't just, can you write a check? Um, and that's part of the entire relationship. Informing, um, make sure that, that whoever you want 
to support you is aware of what you're doing. Uh, this may be new initiatives. This may be new collections you've received. This may be changes to personnel. Keep them familiar with your goals. Let's say you have a big goal for uh, changing the lighting in your entire organization. Fine, great, let people know. Um, it may sound tame, but let them know why. Uh, and let them know why it's gonna cost X number of dollars. And inquire. I have found, and I've done, um, I've done a lot of face-to-face -face meetings with donors. In those meetings, I'm doing maybe 10% of the talking, ideally. Asking open-ended questions, what do you think about this? Have you, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on this program? Would you be interested in this? Asking for feedback, that is how you really get to know people. That's, that's where your donors, that's my dog in the background, that's where your donors are going to open up about themselves and their, their passions. Um, that's where you're gonna learn a lot about them. Uh, you know, I, you don't wanna slot your donor into, well, we need money for, uh, for this new wing, but you, in discussions, you've talked with them and you realize that a collection that you already have is their most favorite thing and what they're passionate about. A new wing might not be their passion or priority. It may be sustaining the collection you already have. So that's where the inquiring is going to really come in. Using these relationships, so those passionate donors, the influential donors, asking them to be, uh, asking your board to help out with the fundraising. You're, you can ask current donors, can you bring friends in to see how this process works? Um, the relationships your organization has, so you have business relationships, you have uh, physical relationships with your area. So if, um, uh, if you are located in the middle of town, say downtown or you know, the town square, whatever it may be for your organization, there are businesses nearby that would love to, for lack of a better word, cross promote with you. And so those physical proximity, that can be very helpful. And it's okay to ask them if they'll just hand out flyers Maybe they want to sponsor a day or sponsor an evening. If they're, um, say, a law firm, they may wait. They, pardon me, they may want to sponsor a week at your organization, providing what the funding would be to keep all the uh, keep the whole organization going for one week, one day, one month, whatever it may be. Uh, and in exchange, you let them host like a. Um, you know, a, a nice event at your organization in a, in a lovely space. That's if that is possible for you. And so um, uh, on the right side here in this blue box, I'm gonna break my dog, stop scratching his eye. How can I help? Usually that uh, people wanna help, but what they don't wanna do is ask for money. Uh, that is that is one of the hard things about using existing relationships. People are a little scared to ask for money. Um, I have a list here. You can host events. You can make calls. If your board wants to make calls and say, uh, hey, thanks for your gift, or we've got this really wonderful event coming up. I hope you can attend. Um, writing thank you notes. I love having volunteers and board members write thank you notes. It is one of my favorite things. Okay, let's get into the, the heart of it. A solicitation should be reflective of your organization, looking at who are those potential donors? How do they want to be solicited? Um, I, For instance, I give to my alma mater monthly because I don't want to write a check. I don't feel like it. I don't want to remind myself every year, here's what I have to do to support this organization. I like it to come out of my credit card. I don't like to be bothered with calls, emails, reminders. That's me. Your donors may like to be called. Um, not to uh, not to make you know any sweeping judgments. 
uh, older donors that I've had, they have enjoyed being called and having a nice conversation. Um, some donors just like to get a quick email, um, but whatever their preference is, go with it. Uh, we're going to look into some of these options shortly, but uh, if you are just getting started, don't overdo it. it. Start with one or two options. Look at what's going to fit your time frame best. Look at what's going to work for you. Try that first. If it doesn't work, maybe reconsider for the next time. Maybe adapt something new. Maybe, you know, slow down. It's okay. You don't have to do everything at once. Um, and to make a point of that, here's another picture from the Smithsonian collection, just because I, I love the photos. I have done fundraising marathons. It is an atrocious amount of work. Uh, you're getting up at 4 a.m., you're, you're lugging stuff around, you're making so many calls. It is so much work. I would not, if I could ever avoid it, I would never want to do that kind of event again because of the amount of time. For your organization, maybe you have the people and the passion to do it, but be mindful of what you wanna do and what's gonna work for you. Don't over encumber yourself. Finally, when that answer is no, you're going to hear no from people. It's okay. Sometimes it is no, I'm not interested. Sometimes it's not right now. And that's an opening to try again later. Sometimes is no, not that. And that's an opening to say, well, what about this? Some of the common solicitation types, um, annual fund, I've got a slide on that later. Uh, this is the broad audience. This is gonna be uh, everyone in your orbit. Um, and it is, uh, I say multi-channel, what I mean by that is you can use direct mail letters, you can follow it with an email, you can make a phone call, you have a lot of options. It's generally, um, annual fund is kind of a catch-all for general support. And it's very straightforward. People kind of expect to get a letter from charitable organizations at the end of the year. Um, the risk for annual fund is you are, you're constantly renewing. Uh, every year you have to make a new case um, and you're competing with a lot of other organizations that are doing this. And annual funds are seeing a declining return on their investment. This has been the case for uh, about 15 years. People aren't responding to the letters or emails as much. Um, so you, you should be aware of that before you say, well, a letter is going to fix everything. It may help, it may be a lot of work without as much return. Events are very popular, especially for historical organizations, arts and culture organizations, because it has that broad appeal. Who does not want to come and, uh, and do a harvest event, just because of the season, uh, a harvest event at the museum? This can also be seen as fundraising. So um, in that gift chart, moving people's inclination to, to want to support you. And there is potentially some good return on investment. Um, there are a lot of events that I'm not going to say anyone should do the Met Gala because the amount of work blows my mind, but that raises a huge amount of money. So there, there's a lot that comes out of it. The other side, events are time and resource. Well, they can be black holes of your time and all of your resources. Uh, it, it can be so much effort. And if you have an outdoor event and the weather doesn't cooperate, if you have an indoor event and the weather doesn't cooperate, today is kind of a perfect day to, to, you know, uh, to say that things happen that can completely shut down everything. Um, so that is one of the risks for events. Grants are very popular for uh, nonprofits because they could be large donations supporting a very specific project. And it's structured. I think a lot of people like that there is structure to a grant where you don't have to glad hand to, you know, 
uh, you can just write the reports, you can write the solicitation, uh, and it's a lot more straightforward. And that works for some people. Um, as someone who's been working in the funder side of grants for about four years, um, grants take a lot of time. Uh, there's a lot of steps. Um, and there is high competition for grants, especially with arts and culture organizations. Um, you will be spending tons of time competing with a lot of organizations uh, that have you know, resources you may not. So if your project fits with the parameters of this grant program, go for it. If you can, uh, if you can actually pull it off, go for it. If you're trying to fit a uh, square peg into a round hole with the grant program, just because there's a lot of funding, grant funders are aware and they don't get funded. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to be so blunt, but they don't get funded. It's, and that is a huge amount of your time spent doing that. Um, with major gifts, that would be your top 80%. These will be your largest donors. This, uh, this approach has the highest return on investment, but it depends on um, a small group of donors. Things change, priorities change. Um, I spent uh, about six years with major gifts and it's, it's wonderful work, I love it. But if a donor's priorities don't align with yours, there's only so much you can do about that. Um, and if things change, you're, you're making a lot of bets on a small pool of donors to come through. And then plan giving. I'm not gonna really touch on plan giving, but I do like to remind people that it's an option. Um, this would be larger, more accessible giving options. This could be requests, this could be uh, insurance policies, this could be um, gifts of anything that aren't really money. Um, and they have kind of a deferred status. Um, I think plain gifts are great because you have people who couldn't make a massive gift in their lifetime able to do this um, once they've passed and maybe after their wife has passed. Um, and they are, it's, it's, a, it's a good long-term giving strategy. So if it's something that you think would be worthwhile exploring, I think it's, it has a very good um, outlook. And I think that this is the time to do that, but they are potentially complex. Um, it can take a while to set up the programs and to see a return, the actual money come in will take a while. If you need funds now, maybe this is something to wait for a different time. Whoops. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, my mouse is very sensitive. You're gonna look at this, and the first thing you're gonna notice is going to be the cockroach. There's a reason. And I write, usually when I talk about this, I, I, I have to wait a second for people to collect themselves because they wonder why on earth am I showing them a cockroach? As I said before, annual giving is typically general support. This is what is collectively known as keeping the lights on doesn't have to be stated as such. Um, annual funds have this issue where they are considered once a year because it's an annual fund. You can ask for annual funding year round. It doesn't have to be once a year, doesn't have to be December. Um, be aware of the natural giving times. So if your organization has a very prominent anniversary date, maybe there's a date in a collection piece or a founder, or the date that your organization had some huge change. Those may be natural dates to uh, reach out to your, your general donors because you're on their minds. Um, so maybe it's not December, maybe it's July, maybe it's in August. Whatever time people are donating, um, and I would look back at your past um, giving history for your donors to see when are people most likely giving. Um, whatever approach, if you want to write a letter, it's, it's tried and true. Whatever approach you, you pick, have a follow-up. So um, I would typically, if I'm writing letters, I would send out the letters and I would put in the letter that I will be in touch via email or 
Uh, I'll I'll give you a call uh, within two weeks to to uh, follow up with you. Always follow up with them and um, be consistent with it. So uh, sometimes I may really love an organization. I get their letter. I I take the letter. I'm like, this is something I'm going to do. I set it aside. Maybe my son like decides to write on it with his crayon. It happens. When I get that follow up, it's a reminder I need to do this. And this organization really cares that I make this gift. So please always follow up on your annual gifts. And now why I've got a roach in here, personalize your annual giving. Annual giving is perceived as kind of throwing money into a pit of just, we need your whatever you can give. That's not, that's not what your donors need to hear. This is something, um, this is a annual fund kind of, I think this was a social media one um, from a, uh, a zoo in the United Kingdom. For Valentine's Day, you could name a roach for $1.50. And why would you do that? It's Valentine's Day. Because the roaches are fed to the animals and you can pay to feed a named roach to an animal. That name may be one of your exes. It's very tongue in cheek. A lot of zoos have actually started adopting this. Um, sometimes it's to adopt the roaches for their own collection for bugs. Uh, sometimes it is Let's name the roaches after everybody that drives you crazy, and we're going to have a video of feeding them to the iguanas. It's novel. It's fun. It's a, you can see here, it's a, a pound 50. Um, very approachable, and it raises awareness. But this works for the zoos. For you, it may be, let's sponsor this wedding dress. Wedding dresses are very popular, very common uh, donation item. And the work that goes into preserving them is pretty intense. Um, so you are, for this much money, looking at what goes into, collect into preserving that dress, for this much money, you can be the person who has sponsored this dress. And you'll preserve Sarah Beth's uh, memory and that this important day in her life for time and memorial, however you want to raise it. Um, or you may want to do something along the lines of this book collection contains some of Dr. Pritchard's notes and to preserve this legacy, we have to preserve these books. Your gift of $50 can buy these materials that will preserve these notes. Bringing in a tangible personal area for it is what's going to get your donors most excited. Now, you, you may look at this and think those oh, annual giving, giving them references for what these funds can do. Does it cost a pound 50 for this roach? No, it does not. But it is representative of what this gift can do. It can help feed the animals. That $50 can preserve the notes. And I don't have a slide for major gifts because with plan gifts, major gifts, your biggest donors, it's all about face-to-face -face solicitation. This is tried and true for centuries, honestly, not by me, but Face-to-face -face solicitation is the expectation your biggest donors will have for uh, being asked for a large sum of money. You are much, much less likely to receive a huge donation by writing someone a letter or sending them an email. Um, this is also the place where a lot of people have the most trepidation about fundraising, because this is the point where you're in front of someone and the answer may be no, that's okay. It's okay to be scared. I am anxious about all of uh, my solicitations because the answer may always be no, or I may have gotten it wrong. But until I ask, that answer is always going to be no. Face-to-face -face solicitation should be reserved for those key donors, the most passionate, the ones with the wealth, because um, it's not that you don't want to talk to everybody. It's that you cannot. You do not have the time. 
But this is for those people. It may take multiple meetings. Um, it, it could easily, I've had meetings where it takes uh, three or four over the course of a year. Uh, sometimes it's a little faster. Sometimes it'll go on for five years. There's really no way to determine what it'll take. Whatever choice you make with your face-to-face -face solicitations, please set expectations prior to the meeting. So if, you're, if you do not intend to ask them for money, you just want to get to know them, you can say that when you're contacting them. You can say, hey, I'd like to you know, show you around the collection, show you some of the new items, tell you about some of the uh, materials that we've gotten in recently. And I, you know, I'd like to remind you what giving can do. You are not soliciting them. Make them aware of that. It's not that you're trying to, you know, get them to come in. Well, you are, but it's not that you're trying to trick them and just say, hey, so do you actually want to support this? You need to be upfront with people because if you catch someone off guard and you say, oh, you know, I'd love for you to, to come in and see this collection. And I think you'd be really interested in this. And then during the, the whole meeting, you say, would you be able to give $25,000? If that hasn't come up organically, and, you know, I hope it does, but if it hasn't, you're going to make your donor feel like you have only lured them in to ask them for money. Make them aware that you are, you are in a relationship and that fundraising is important to the relationship, but it's not all that matters. With prioritization, so I had alluded to earlier that uh, the major gifts will take time. Three to four visits is pretty common. Uh, again, it may take less, may take more. Look at the timing. Is this timing based on what your needs are or your donors? Some people do the, the very consistent, I make my gifts at the end of the year. Fine, great. Ask them at the end of the year. Um, if they give because it's the anniversary of something important to them, that's when you'd want to ask. And then with prioritization, you'll notice I have what are the expectations of your donors and your community. If your community is one that loves hosting events and loves having uh, you know, a lot of big gatherings, uh, I'm from New Orleans, that is kind of their deal. Go with it, great. But if, you're organi if you are part of a community that kind of, they don't want to do the big affairs, they're more one-on-one, -on -one, you can still have events, but they might be three to six people just having a small gathering at your organization. So look at what they want and need. Don't just shoehorn it up. Now we come to the second odd picture that I have. Stewardship. As you will call, this is renewing that fundraising cycle. And it is vital. You are rebuilding that relationship. They have said, yes, I care about your organization. Yes, I'm going to support you. What they're also saying is, I trust you. And you need to show them that they can trust you. So if you say that these funds are going to preserve uh, this small library of books, show them. Show them pictures, tell, tell, keep them updated on, well, we've gotten through row one, we've found a few issues here, and turns out we're going to have to send some of these books off to a conservator. Keep them in the loop. It's that whole informing part from cultivation that I, I mentioned. But your, your stewardship should be reflective of the gift in the donor. You, you need to be um, consistent in a way that you're not treating all of your $50 donors like they are big $5,000 donors because it's just going to jumble everything up. And then when somebody does give $5,000, they're going to say, well, why didn't you amp up the stewardship? Um, but you should be consistent with it. And uh, what I have here, this picture, this is something that I did for my board when I was with Tulane. You'll notice it's some tiles. And I, I drove around town. I took some pictures of New Orleans. I, I prettied them up and I set them into the tiles. Um, it's, you know, uh, we wrapped them up in some nice Tulane colored ribbon and gave it out. It took, you know, a weekend of work. Um, it costs fairly little money, but some of my board members loved it. 
because they loved their time at Tulane. They loved their experience. And this was a reminder that, hey, I know this is important to you. I'm giving you a gift of these photos that are reflective of your passion. And it's not that you have to give a gift to somebody, but looking at a way to say thank you in a meaningful way will go so much further. I have gone a little over time. I do apologize for that. But if I can uh, reaffirm a few things, always have a plan for your fundraising. Be consistent with it. Stay on, on task. Fundraising is based on relationship building and it's going to depend on your community, but find the best ways to engage with your, your audience. That's, that's natural for you and natural for them. And there's a ton of options for solicitation. You don't have to do what everyone else is doing. Work, use what works for you and just build on it. Uh, and whatever you do for fundraising, it's good and it's okay. All right. So that is my slides. I am happy to take some of your questions now. And Robin, if you were able to, I can pull up some of the Q&A or the chat. Yeah, that'd be great. I'm a, I actually am looking through it right now as well, because some people have brought up some very interesting points that oh, I think we can yeah, start our talk about. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were talking, <laughs> some of us were chatting about that roach picture that you uh, yeah that always gets an, uh, that always gets a response well and i was kind of saying like i wonder if you could do an, an, an ipm <laughs> type fundraiser integrated pest management type adopt a roach roach stop the pest from getting it adopt a roach yeah exactly no, i like so, that yeah yeah well, one one thing, well, two, one question just came up, which I think we can talk a little bit more about. So they, they basically just asked, can you talk a little bit more about just online giving and your experience oh. with online giving? Absolutely. So online giving is usually an offset of, um, of the annual giving program. Um, and uh, uh, this, is, this is a growing area. So uh, direct mail letters, phone calls are, are on the decline, but online giving is... Uh, on the rise. That's how I do most of my giving. That's not to my alma mater. That's how um, that's how the bulk of millennials and um, Gen Z give now, I believe. Um, and with online giving, uh, you will have to have a good, strong online presence. Um, so that doesn't mean you have to do everything. But um, setting up a platform uh, may take a little time. Some of those um, Salesforce, for instance, they have an online giving tool that you can pay additional money for, um, where they'll set up the whole uh, donate here box and everything, and you just kind of paste the code on your website. Um, but what a lot of organizations who might have smaller budgets, they may not have a dedicated system like that. What they've been using is PayPal. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. But um, with your online giving, uh, no matter who it is, uh, no matter what size you are, they are going to take a percentage off the top um, for credit cards. Um, this is actually kind of a good thing in a way. Um, it's not good to lose money, but with someone else processing the credit card, they're also taking, um, they're taking control of that credit card number and information. So it's not your responsibility to protect that donor information that is already protected. And, and that's that's a helpful thing. Um, but be aware that it's not just going to be donors sending in 100 bucks and you get 100 bucks, you'll get 100 bucks minus 3% is pretty typical, 6%, 8% is a little high, but it's not uncommon. Um, a lot of these processors, um, PayPal, um, Bitly, Captera, they will make, um, they will reduce their fees for nonprofits and they may reduce fees based on the size of your organization. What they'll limit it to though is uh, how much money you're generating and how many gifts. So there's a lot of good options out there, but I'd look into what are the fee schedules. Um, and something that I would stress is when you're asking for donations online, you can have a lot of the implements of your, your letters or your asks 
Um, but uh, don't ask for information from your donors that you don't absolutely need. Um, and uh, uh, at the same time, have a thank you page always for if they have made a gift. Um, put links in there for social media. It's a great way to remind people. And be consistent about your social media presence. So if, um, if you have a YouTube channel, I love watching some of the different museums on YouTube and, and them going through their stories. Um, have a reminder at the very end that, you know, you can support stories like this by giving to here and just be consistent with it. So I hope that was helpful. Yeah, no, I think it was. I was just I was laughing to myself too when you were saying that millennial and uh, Gen Z like online giving. I'm just at the end of Gen X and I enjoy online giving as well. <laughs> so because I'm lazy, trying to find a checkbook in my house is always an adventure. <laughs> That's for Most sure. Most of Gen X is that way. Most, uh, <laughs> although I don't know if it is 51% or more, but last I checked, it was close to most of Gen X. Yeah. <laughs> um, someone brought up the idea of the Adopt an Artifact program, which I've seen at a lot of different places uh, talking about care. They Their institution actually discouraged it because they felt like uh, donors might think that they were trying to purchase the artifact as yep. compared to helping out with conservation efforts. Do you have any thoughts on that? Like, I, I would yes. hope to think that the messaging would say, you're helping to preserve this, not you're going to get one of these. But what, 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 were, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that is a common issue when it comes to um, objects and collections. Um, and um, I think one of the key things to do with uh, any adopt an object item is to kind of show them the process of what you intend to do. So um, I, I like using address because it's, you know, it can be complicated, but at the same time, you know, there are things already set up to do this, but showing them the work that goes into it, uh, do you have to fix items, do you have to send it to a conservator, um, you know, and just kind of take them through the process. You may not want to do this for every object, but kind of take them through a general process. So um, say books, manuscripts, things like that, you'll kind of take them through the process of what needs to happen for these. Um, so make it very clear that that's the case for one. Um, and I'm, <laughs> I have a hard time seeing how people think I'm going to get the item, but I'm looking at it from my own perspective, which is a fundraiser. But just be very clear and upfront about what is happening. Um, and I did see that one great comment about uh, being discouraged from doing adopt an artifact because you know they don't want the money, it, want it to look like this is exactly what we're going to do. And in that case, and, and I, I come up against this a lot, um, it's a good reminder that well, when you have organizations that do a lot of work, especially for um, uh, say needy groups or, or um, kids, things like that, they'll break down the funding into, well, you get those commercials that are like a dollar a day can feed the starving child for a month. It's so hard to believe that. Um, but breaking down the cost of your organization to, let's say, Here's all the work that goes into our, um, you know, our automobile collection because those things are so expensive. We have to con we even though it's not being used, we have to have someone maintain the the uh, the oil and the fluids, and we have to make sure that the rubber isn't degrading or th or the paint or things like that. And so your support will contribute to maintaining items like our automobile collection. Um, I would just look at the language that you're using in your, your uh, solicitations as to your $50 will preserve the library. Your $50 will preserve the library. Maybe it's not. So it would be instead your $50 donation will help support things such as the constant preservation of our library, 
the automobile collection, our, you know, uh, first responder exhibit that has brought in 500 K through 12 student groups. Um, so it's using that word like, um, and uh, some people find that deceptive, I understand. Um, I'm not trying to be deceptive when I communicate that. What I'm trying to do is say that your money supports many things. These are some of those things. Um, and what you're most comfortable with will depend on you. But do look at your expenses. Look at what, what it costs to maintain a day at your place. Okay. I'm thinking of a lot of different parallels right now just with collections care where you know, like, and I'm sure you've seen this too, that when you get donations, right, of objects, the last thing you want is a donation that is so restrictive that you can't use the object, right? <laughs> so like, that's, that's always really frustrating from a collections management standpoint, because when people give you these things that can really enhance your collection or really show the history of something or the culture of something, to then be told, well, you can't show it, it can only be there for certain things. It can only be out. Then you're kind of like, you feel like your hands are tied, right? So, which is kind of the same way you're talking about funding, which is super, super interesting. The other thing I keep thinking about is how there's this big movement right now amongst the collections community of demystifying what we do, right? Yeah. Opening the doors and, let, and showing people, this is, this is what happens behind the scenes, not to call it behind the scenes, but to be like, this is what happens within collections and this is what it costs and this is what you have to do. So all those things kind of work in with what you're talking about where, you know what I mean? You want to show like, this is where the money's going to give them exact ideas of where the money is going. Right. But at the same time, being honest and showing, you know, like this, this is all the actual stuff. This is what it costs. This is how much a box costs, <laughs> like, which I think always shocks people whenever they see how much these kind of asset free boxes cost. So yeah, I'm just thinking of the parallels right now as you were talking about it. So it's very interesting. Yeah, and um, that is, um, that comes up to a problem that drives me nuts because all of you listening, all of you who are looking at fundraising and, and maybe you're a little apprehensive about this, you're doing something awesome. You know, asking for money mm -hmm. is not a bad thing. You have you have value, and that value should be celebrated. You, if it costs five hundred dollars to maintain part of your collection, that's what it costs. I I would not want any of you to do a haphazard job on protecting your collection. That is your mission. Be upfront with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a high price tag, but that's what it is. And you should be upfront. There's nothing wrong with, uh, with being open and transparent with people. Um, as I, I'm gonna guess, a lot of museum people did not get into their field because of the big box. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't start working for the Historical Society, the, the Indiana Historical Society, because I thought this was a big payday. I thought it, I thought it would be fun and it was, it was awesome. Um, but if it costs X number of dollars to preserve a vital part of your collection, show them why. That's fine. Um, your kids programming, um, kids love to touch things. Um, when I used to give tours at the World War II Museum, I would bring some props. And of course, they were not collections items, but kids love to touch that. Having um, funds that go into, you know, replacing those things that kids break. Um, just being upfront that we expect to have to replace that. You, we expect to have to print out materials. We expect to have, you know, lunches for kids who come from underserved areas because they typically don't bring lunches. Yeah. Great, share it. Yeah, I think that that's the thing is you don't want to mystify where the money is going, right? Like you want to be, it, it's, it's, no, these are going towards actionable things, which then I think makes the funders want to, you know, give more money because they'll see what's happening with their money. It's like, even when you were talking about grant stuff, how like, it's like, if you can start listing things, you know what I mean? Being like, these are the things we want to work on that are actionable, still give yourself some gray area. So you don't want to lock yourself in. But if you have some actionable things that you can do, that's really, really important. So 
Um, someone in the chat said, can you give any examples of organizations that tell their stories well to donors? Yep. Can you think of any off the top of your head? Oh, yeah, there's really good ones. Um, and, and I'll have to skew a little bit. Um, one that I particularly love, since we were talking about the adopt a book, um, adopt an item, um, this is a little off the, excuse me, purview, but the New York Public Library, they're a massive organization. They are doing a huge amount of fundraising. And the reason I bring them up is because I don't have that kind of money personally, but I love books, I love libraries, and I love the New York Library because it's beautiful. What I can do and what they make accessible is I can adopt a book. And they show, here's what you get. You get a little nameplate. If you want to make it in honor of someone, you get that. For $250, I believe, you, um, I think they have, um, you create an educational backpack, I believe, for a student group. Um, and for a higher amount, it is you pay for liter uh, um, literacy classes for people um, at risk youth, I believe, that don't have, you know, that are struggling to learn in, in New York. But they're breaking it down in ways that as you move up, you're, you're showing more things that you're doing. These are their programs. These are things that you probably care about if you're donating. And they make it approachable for someone who may only have 50 bucks to give. Um, so they're a good place to look for some of those adopt an item um, online giving. Uh, and staying with New York, honestly, uh, one of the groups that I love is the Tenement Museum out of, uh, uh, out of New York. Uh, I actually just visited them uh, last month, I believe, but they tell such great stories and they really bring home, um, you know, your own experience, maybe, you know, Maybe your family came in from Sicily. Maybe your family came in from Germany, whatever it might be. Um, your own experience, and they tie that into theirs. And they, they talk about things that are a little outside of um, academic sources, like cooking. And they'll host more events about ethnic cooking that would have been appropriate for their time and how those family uh, family recipes have kind of evolved and changed and morphed. And I love that because they always tie fundraising into it. Who paid for this? Um, you know, where does this come from? How do we make this possible? Uh, but, uh, oh shoot, I just had one that uh, I just lost. There it is, the Columbus Museum of Art. I also love what they do because they use a lot of their fundraising to kind of bring home, here's a more hands-on approach to art. And it's not the idea of funding, well, you know, we've got these multi-million dollar paintings so much as your funding is going to help visitors and student groups get a grasp on art, do their own art, have their own say in the art. And I do love that personally. Those are great. Thank you. And yeah, I went to the Tenement Museum years ago and um, it meant a lot, especially for someone, if you notice my maiden name is Bauer, my German background and seeing that I was kind of like, wow, <laughs> it's like this really puts into perspective our immigrant story that happened in the early 19, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s and kind of put things into context. And I, I enjoy, they had a book that came out a bunch of years ago called 97 Orchard Street that talked about just the food pathways there. And it was a really good read. So I would recommend that to anyone just on how to take that information. Well, it looks like we've hit most of the questions in the Q&A box. Do you have any final thoughts for our audience as we... I have, today's so, I have so many thoughts, but I think since I am a talker, I'm going to conclude uh, what I have to say with um, one of the first things that I that I heard as a fundraiser that made it easier for me, and I hope that y'all will will take to heart, is you're doing something good, and you should be proud of it. And when you ask for money, you should be proud that you are going to use that money to do something awesome. So 
if that helps you feel a little less apprehensive when you ask people for money, good, because you should be proud of this. That's perfect. Thank you. And yeah, that goes along with what I often tell people when I when I talk to just museums and stuff is I say like your stuff is awesome. <laughs> people want to know about it. Like so please, you know, feel comfortable talking about the stuff in collections and yeah. and all that stuff back there. So it goes a long line with that. Well, I'll just point say a huge thank you to you uh, for this presentation today. It was great. Um, thank you to our, our producers at Learning Time. Um, I did put links to the presentation and the resource sheet we put together for this webinar in the chat, along with a link to our survey that we always put out for our IMLS. So please fill that out if you can. This recording should be up on the AIC FAIC YouTube channel by the end of the week at the latest. Cool. Um, and yeah, so again, thank you everyone. And we'll see you in October for our next free webinar. And if you have any questions, just go to connecting to collections.org. So thanks and everyone stay safe for the rest of the month. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Bye. -bye. I hope this was helpful for y'all. All right. Thanks Bryce. Appreciate it. Thank you.